Good afternoon, everybody. You will notice that this session is being recorded. I'm Lisa Jackson Pulver. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Indigenous Services and Strategy at the University of Sydney. I'm a Professor of Public Health and a Public Health Epidemiologist. First and foremost, I would like to say respects to country. I'm coming to you from Gadigal land here in central Sydney. I pay respects to traditional owners past, present and future. I pay respects to all of the countries, the elders past, present and future that you come from today. Today, you'll be hearing about Aussage and the advice that we have on New South Wales COVID-19 roadmap and you'll be hearing from a number of professionals who will each speak for a few minutes about their work and how this adds to the body of knowledge and advice here in Australia. There'll be time for questions at the end. Please raise your hand or place a question in the Zoom chat and we'll do our best to answer those in order. Please remain muted unless you're asking a question and please know you can either tap your questions into the chat or put your hand up later on. If you have any further media inquiries after today's teleconference, please direct those inquiries to Amy Stevenson, that is amy.stevenson, spelt with a V, at sydney.edu.au. We'll provide her contact details later. Today's conference is recorded and will be made available on the Aussage website later. So, who is Aussage? Aussage is a multidisciplinary, diverse network of more than 80 Australian experts from a broad range of sectors relevant to the well-being of the Australian population, particularly during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. And numbers continue to grow. We have expertise in medicine, nursing, paediatrics, public health, epidemiology, infectious diseases, engineering, social science, architecture, planning, data science, economics, policy, law and more. Aussage was formed in response to the pandemic under a set of shared values and principles. We offer independent consensus expert advice. We offer this via outputs of our growing number of working groups, which adds to the available advice and information that is broadly available to governments for their use. To be clear, Aussage offers an additional resource for government, non-government stakeholders and the community. Aussage has multiple working groups developing independent advice on public health, health systems and other policy matters relevant to COVID-19 control with diverse and multiple disciplinary perspectives. Aussage provides decision support underpinned by the best scientific evidence, modelling and other research to inform the choice between policy alternatives. Aussage provides rapid advice during urgent public health events and Aussage can assist with the safe opening up of Australia. We're ready to assist with the national goal of achieving an exit strategy from this pandemic with the best possible health, social and economic outcomes. Members of Aussage are not paid and provide their time without remuneration and without a political agenda. There are four pillars to our advice for a pandemic exit strategy. And these are broadly, to live with occasional outbreaks rather than widespread disease to ensure ventilation, that is safe indoor air and vaccine plus strategies, which we believe are essential for lifting of restrictions. We believe that no one should be left behind. No demographic, no one in the region or remote areas, and no one who are, are usually underrepresented and underserviced. This particularly includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and those living away from the large vaccination centred areas. And finally, protection of the health system. It's a precious resource. And at the moment, many in our health services are feeling the effects of nearly 18 months of this pandemic. And we know that we still have a much further way to go. So daily, please check our website um, and also follow us on Twitter at Real Sage. So who's speaking today? Today, we've got four speakers. They'll briefly speak to their area of expertise and then, as stated, we'll open the floor to questions. The first is Professor Nancy Baxter from the University of Melbourne, who will wrap up on the statistics for the past week. Following her is Dr. Karina Powers, occupational medicine physician from Western Australia, and she'll be talking about deaths at home in New South Wales. Thirdly, we'll have Professor Rana McIntyre from the Kirby Institute and the University of New South Wales, who will speak about ICU modelling and advice. 
And finally, we'll be talking to Dr. Kalinda Griffiths, a Scientia lecturer from the Centre of Big Data Research at the University of New South Wales, who will provide Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander working group advice. So now, please stay muted and I'll hand over directly to Professor Nancy Baxter from the University of Melbourne. Thank you very much, um, Lisa, and, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm here from Melbourne uh, on the uh, lands of the Wurundjeri, uh, people who have been custodians of the lands and waterways of this part of, um, of Victoria for uh, thousands of years and many, many generations, and I pay respects to their elders past and present. Um, so just to go to the statistics for the week, um, can we get the slide up? First of all, I will start with the good news. And that is that since the beginning of the vaccination campaign, we have um, delivered almost 23 million vaccine doses in uh, Australia. So a phenomenal result, uh, which is uh, um, uh, now we have uh, over 42% of all Australians have uh, over the age of 16 have had two doses of vaccine and over two thirds, so 67% have received at least one dose of vaccine. So we are getting there, but uh, but um, this, this is not happening. Um, as quickly as any of us would like. And certainly uh, it's, it's a challenge when we have ongoing outbreaks. Uh, when, we, when we look at the outbreaks, uh, what we can see is that uh, we have um, three active outbreaks and one uh, with some potential. So we have ACT, we have Victoria, and we have New South Wales. Um, so the numbers continue to um, be high uh, with the highest number on September 11th being um, uh, 270, 2,072 uh, 2, community acquired cases uh, in Australia, the highest uh, ever. Um, and uh, what we know and what we see is this is a um, uh, outbreak uh, related to um, unvaccinated individuals. So over 50% of the cases uh, occur in people under age 30. So this is uh, COVID is finding the unvaccinated and uh, resulting in infections. Next slide. Um, this is uh, the doubling time. So this shows uh, over time um, how quickly uh, the, uh, the outbreaks are doubling. So on the y-axis, you have the doubling time, and on the x-axis, you have the date. And then you can see the various outbreaks. New South Wales is the long blue line um, going since June. Uh, you have two Victoria outbreaks, the most recent um, uh, is the second line uh, along the x-axis in the ACT outbreak. You have the Queensland uh, new cases, uh, but they um, do seem to be contained at the current time uh, and hopefully will not uh, come on this, uh, on this graph. What you can see from here is um, pleasingly with ACT, you have a fairly um, a rapid increase in the doubling time, meaning it's taking longer for the cases to double, which is uh, excellent for ACT. You have a very slow increase in New South Wales. Gradually over time, the doubling time is increasing, indicating that the outbreak is becoming um, somewhat more controlled and hopefully will be uh, reaching its peak sometime relatively soon. The most concerning thing we have here, of course, is Victoria, where we have the doubling time decreasing. So that means the, um, the outbreak is doubling uh, in shorter amounts of time. Uh, so indicating that the outbreak is not under control uh, and that, um, that uh, the, we can expect cases to be um, increasing fairly rapidly at the current time. Next slide. Sadly, 52 deaths have been reported this week, and four of these deaths have been related to outbreaks in aged care settings. Um, similar to, um, to previous outbreaks of COVID, we see the majority of uh, these individuals uh, dying are uh, elderly over age 70. Uh, but two deaths occurred in people in their 20s. So this is not something that is sparing young people. Uh, it is finding the the unvaccinated and is a serious disease in them as well. Um, six deaths occurred at the home and we'll be hearing more about that now from Dr. Karina Powers. We need to consider all the people dying at home carefully to look for any problems that can be fixed to prevent loss of life. For example, health and ambulance phone lines may not be effectively functioning and or there are long ambulance wait times due to demand or simply People do not know what number to ring for a health service, and there may be concerns about costs incurred. 
Also, there are potential challenges uh, when uh, assessing patients outside the hospital setting, such as using telehealth or other equipment at home. If the people who have died have not yet been vaccinated, why is that? Is there something that could be done to enable them to access a vaccine? Clear lines of contact and communication for as many cultural and language groups as possible is important. AusSage currently has a working group looking at community-driven multicultural response, and we'll release that document soon. AusSage is aware that there have been at least 15 deaths related to COVID disease at home in New South Wales, and the mean age is 49 years since 1st of August this year. On the 1st of August, a man in his 60s in southwestern Sydney passed away. On the 4th of August, a 27-year-old man from Warwick Farm passed away at home. On the 13th of August, a Cabramatta woman in her 40s passed away at home. On the 25th of August, a mother of three, age 30, in Emerton died at home. On the 26th of August, men aged 30 years and in their 60s and 80s from Western Sydney also were deceased. 3rd of September, a mother of her four in her 30s in Guildford passed away. On the 4th of September, a man in his 60s in Western Sydney uh, succumbed to COVID. On the 6th of September, a man in his 60s from the Southern Highlands died. On the 7th of September, a man in his 60s from the Nepean and Blue Mountains area passed on. On the 10th of September, men in their 70s and 60s in South and West Sydney passed away. And on the 11th of September, men aged in their 30s and 40s from southwestern Sydney died. I'll pass over to Raina. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, which is where I'm speaking from. Um, can I have the slides, please? I'm going to talk about the uh, advice document on ICU capacity, which will be released at 4 p.m. on our website, the full document. And I'm just going to go over some of the modeling that's um, informed that advice document. Um, the modeling has been conducted by my research in my research program at the Kirby Institute in UNSW. Uh, with input from intensive care, from the intensive care working group. Next slide. So a lot of people keep talking about COVID becoming endemic. It's not an endemic disease. It will never be endemic. It will always be an epidemic disease. Think more like measles or smallpox, which means that even when it's largely controlled, there'll always be outbreaks. It'll, if it gets into the community, it will find the unvaccinated or undervaccinated people and it'll, it'll cause outbreaks. Um, with, at the current moment, with over 40% of the population unvaccinated, when we reach the targets of 80%, um, the virus will spread as restrictions are lifted. Next slide. So what's modelling? Modeling is a science that's used to predict future outcomes, right? Uh, we can't really know what's going to happen in the future, but it's a scientific way to try and determine what the future holds. And infectious diseases are very suitable for modeling because um, you can, because people exist in mutually exclusive states of being infected, susceptible, recovered, or immune. Um, the models, of course, depend on the, um, sorry, the models, of course, depend on the assumptions made. And ideally, every modeling exercise should give you a range of different scenarios. And the purpose of modeling to inform public health policy is to show the worst and best case scenarios and scenarios in between so that you can choose your strategy and know uh, what are the conditions that could give rise to a worst case scenario. So it doesn't mean when we tell you what a worst case scenario is that that scenario will come to pass. That should be um, used to inform better policy to prevent that from happening. And really you can uh, model an infinite range of scenarios, but for practical reasons, we're just gonna show you six possible scenarios. Um, and none of the modeled outputs are a certain future. They are only possible futures. Usually governments act to prevent bad scenarios. Um, or they act when the health system is under imminent threat. Um, I should say I've got a long track record in modeling, over 100 peer reviewed publications on epidemic models. And I've been uh, working on modeling since uh, 2001. 
Next slide. Um, I also like to just clarify, there's been a lot of talk about the peak and people are thinking about the peak uh, that's uh, occurring. We're being told that things will get worse in October. That's the peak under current restrictions, right? When those restrictions are relaxed, there will be a second peak because the virus then, the gates are open, the virus can spread faster. So the peak that you've heard about so far is under current restrictions. We're gonna talk about the second peak that would occur after freedom's return. Next slide. The methods we've used, and again, the full document will be on the website at 4 p.m. You can go and have a look. Um, so very briefly, it's a model that has already been published and peer reviewed. Um, and we've updated it for the Delta variant using an R0 of six. We incorporate progressive vaccination and mask use testing and tracing, as well as restricted movement under different scenarios. We assume that one dose of either vaccine will give you 31% protection against Delta and two doses between 67 to 88% um, based on published data. We also assume that either vaccine will give you more than 90% protection against hospitalization, ICU and death. Cases on the day that restrictions are lifted were, fit, were estimated by fitting the model to notified cases. That's really important, the number of cases at the time you lift the restrictions. Next slide. So here's the model in blue and the actual cases in red to show you that we've fitted the model to the observed cases to try to estimate how many cases a day we'll have when we relax the restrictions. Next slide. So we've got six models here. Um, the first model is where we relax restrictions when we get to the 70% target. And that's, um, we estimate that to be around the 18th of October. But in that scenario, there's no further freedoms after that. But when you get to 80%, there's more adults who are vaccinated and more adults able to enjoy those freedoms. Scenario two is the same but with enhanced contact tracing. We, we've estimated that the contact, and when we say contact tracing, we mean rapid contact tracing within 24 hours, because if you do the tracing one week afterwards or even two days afterwards, you've missed the boat. To be effective, the contact tracing has to happen very rapidly. Um, we estimate it's happening rapidly in about 20% of cases at the moment. Um, so if that's enhanced to be 50%, you get um, scenario two. Scenario three is a two-stage lifting of restrictions, which as I understand it is what the roadmap plans, which is that at 70%, there's some freedoms granted. And then at 80%, there's additional freedoms granted. Um, so that's a two-stage lifting. Scenario four is the same as three, but with enhanced contact tracing when you lift those restrictions. And scenario five um, and six are a single lifting of restrictions waiting till you get to 80%. Um, one and the second one has enhanced contact tracing. Next slide. So we were interested in code red. Code red is when um, I think 926 or over 900 ICU beds are required in a single day for COVID and non-COVID patients. So here are the six scenarios and three of them, number three, four and five do take you into code red conditions. Um, that is number three is where you have the first restriction at 70% um, and then a second really relaxing of restrictions at 80%. Um, and that's the worst case scenario. It gives you five weeks of code black from the 9th of December to the 15th of January. The peak number of daily ICU beds, the most you'll need in any single day will be 1,192. Scenarios four and five, um, are slightly better, four will give you one week of code black and um, five will give you four weeks of code black. All of those roughly cover the Christmas New Year period. Um, so the best case scenario is, is scenario two, where you um, only have the single lifting of restrictions at, at 70% and you don't add any more additional um, freedoms, but you have more people able to enjoy those freedoms when they get to 80%. Um, next slide. This is uh, the hospital beds shown uh, graphically for the scenarios. The colours correspond to the numbers and you can see that scenario three, the purple, 
is the worst case scenario. And you can see that the worst of it's going to hit around Christmas if the restrictions are lifted in the middle of October. Um, if you lift the restrictions for the first time in November, uh, we estimated that might be around the 6th of November, then you push the peak to January. And it's a lower peak. Next slide. This is the same for ICU and the line represents the code red. Um, and you can see the green, blue and purple lines all take you into code red territory. Next slide. So in summary, the 70 to 80% targets correspond to 56 to 64% of the whole population. Half of the unvaccinated will be children and the other half will be adults. When the restrictions are relaxed, there will be a larger second peak that'll occur that may, depending on how it's managed, threaten the provision of healthcare. If the first relaxation of restrictions occurs in the middle of October, in all scenarios, the second larger peak will occur between December 24th and 29th, roughly. If relaxing of restrictions is delayed until 80% of adult vaccination targets met, then the epidemic peak will be pushed out to January instead of around Christmas. Next slide. Um, the worst case scenario with prolonged code black conditions occurs if there is two stage relaxing of restrictions when the 70 and 80% targets are met. So additional freedoms. Um, we, we really think it's better that if, if relaxing of restrictions occurs around the middle of October, that no further relaxation occurs to avoid that, that worst case scenario. If further relaxation of restrictions occur, then a New South Wales could face a, a you know, serious situation. The other thing I, I didn't mention is that once you can't provide ICU care to people who need it, then the death rate starts to go up. Because, and that's exactly what we saw in Europe last year. It's really, really important in any of these scenarios to make sure we can do really high, keep our testing rates really high and rapid um, because um, that's very, very influential finding the cases. We really need to scale up the rapid contact tracing capacity um, uh, and higher mask use. So not dropping the outdoor mask mandate would mitigate the epidemic. Um, if any of these things drop, the epidemic gets worse. Next. Um, this is a graph on here on the right there from Independent Sage. And this is just, just to remind you again of what Lisa said, that vaccine plus, which is vaccines and masks and other measures and ventilation or safe indoor air are necessary. All these other European countries went with the vaccine plus and ventilation solutions, except for the UK that just relied on vaccines. And you can see what's happened, what a difference it makes. Um, it does make a difference. So we, we recommend maintaining the full mask mandate, um, that remembering that vaccine alone is not enough. We really need to look at digital technologies and automated methods to scale up rapid contact tracing. That may require uh, using public health law to override privacy concerns and ensure the testing is also high. We need to protect our health workers to mitigate health system failure. And I think that involves, in our recommendations, you'll see we've recommended that healthcare workers get a third dose booster six to eight months after their second dose. And all workers in health facilities should have airborne personal protective equipment and stockpiles of PPE need to be increased. Next. Um, and there's a range of other restrictions, maybe in the interest of time, I uh, won't go into all of them, but we do need disaggregated data for Aboriginal communities and also for regional areas to make sure that these communities are not left vulnerable. If they don't have really high vaccination rates, the virus is gonna find those communities and spread through them really rapidly. And I think we need to communicate to the public the implications of ICU surge and what happens if we get to a scenario where we cannot provide standard of care for patients who need it. Next. The limitations is that all models have uncertainty into them. In them, uh, you know, you can get a range of different um, outputs, which is why we've given six different scenarios. The worst case scenario rarely eventuates because authorities usually either look at that and say, "Okay, well, I need to do X, Y, and Z to prevent that from happening," or when the health system starts to fail, they reinstate restrictions um, to stop it from getting worse. We assumed in our model that testing rates are constant and high. If that is not the case, or if the test capacity drops, the epidemic will get worse. 
If the tracing rates fall and the caseloads become higher, the epidemic will get worse. We also underestimated deaths by not including the rising case fatality rate in the code red scenarios, code black scenarios. Next slide. I think that's, that's my last slide. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Kalinda. Thanks, Lisa. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we're meeting here today. I'm coming to you from Larrakee country in Darwin and pay my respects to all elders, those of the past and the present. Um, so we need to make sure that no one is left behind. And to do this, it is a recommendation of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Osage Working Group that at least 85%, with a preference of over 90% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people need to be vaccinated before New South Wales opens up. So Aboriginal health leaders from other states and territories are also advocating for higher rates of vaccinations um, with John Patterson from the Aboriginal Medical Service Northern Territory recommending that between 90 and 95% vaccination rates for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And this is because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a younger age distribution. Um, we also have higher rates of underlying conditions that can impact disease severity caused by COVID. And as Ryan, Raina um, noted that if COVID does get into communities, um, it's going to spread very, very quickly. So to date, there has been 1,574 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander COVID-19 cases since the start of the New South Wales outbreak. And it's at about 30, 40 cases currently being seen each day. And this is relative to uh, uh, under 200 um, cases since the start of the pandemic in Australia nationally. So it, it's quite an extraordinary jump. So 640 cases have been in the West and, and far West New South Wales since the first Walgett case on the 11th of August as well. So we have the capability as a nation to ensure the safety and security of all of our citizens, um, but there is much work that needs to be done to better support the vaccination of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within New South Wales and Australia. So currently only 25% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over the age of 12 years have been fully vaccinated. 51% have had at least one vaccination. And the good news is, is that thanks to the extensive efforts of the Aboriginal community controlled health organisations um, and, and also the efforts from both the Commonwealth and state governments, the pace of the vaccine rollout for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in New South Wales has been moving quite quickly. Um, this is also the case in Victoria at the moment, but we do need more assistance across the other jurisdictions in Australia. Um, but it's still at a rate that's much lower than for the general population. Uh, so we know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are being vaccinated at a rate that's about 20% lower than the general population. It's therefore really important that vaccine supply and necessary resources be urgently provided to the Aboriginal medical services and the community controlled um, health sector to, uh, and also service support teams. So like the Australian medical assistance teams across communities um, to improve these vaccination rates. Um, the fact is, is that due to New South Wales, the New South Wales COVID outbreak um, and the impact in regional remote areas, the gaps in public health and primary healthcare systems are now being seen. Um, as the case, number, case numbers rise, health systems become strained. Um, but for services in regional remote areas, this impact can be crippling. So we've already seen from the stories coming out of Wilcannia that people have already had issues with accessing services while being very unwell with COVID. So urgent support for these services are already needed. And if the plan is to open up at 70%, then this could prove to be catastrophic for those regions. Um, so this is the time for governments to be listening um, to communities and Aboriginal um, medical services and those people working on the ground in those regions. Um, one of the other big gaps as well is in the limitations regarding the transparency, the quality, as well as the availability of disaggregated data as well. So this is the data that's broken down and displayed by population groups, so by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population group and by the regions that they're in as well for vaccination rates. Um, and this is important because it lets us know who needs what where and um, communities can use this data to advocate for their needs. 
Um, there's also been no public release of the denominator data used to derive Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander vaccine proportions, and this needs redressing. So um, this will let us know when we hit the proposed 85 to 90 plus vaccine rates for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So before New South Wales opens up, ensuring the safety of all population groups is required so that no one is left behind. Okay, I'll thank you. Yourself. Thanks very much, Kalinda. Uh, no one left behind is a, a critical message. So thank you for that again. Uh, so we do have a number of questions and some opportunities for some questions. Um, the first question will be directed to Rana and it's regarding her table one about scenario one to six. And this is coming from Liam from The Australian. Uh, do you think, um, which scenario out of one to six do you think most reflects the current reality and policy, Rana? It's hard to say, actually, because from the press conference from the Premier today, it seemed um, there was a bit of uncertainty about what the next step would be and how the roadmap would unfold after the 70%. Um, so they may be reconsidering, I'm not sure, but my from reading the initial roadmap and from what I'd heard previously, it seemed like scenario three was what the intention was, which is some relaxation on at 70% and then additional relaxation at 80%. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so Liam has another question specifically about how long can the system cope with a prolonged code black condition? So the exact question is, can you explain the health system consequences and human health outcomes of prolonged code black conditions? So I think there might be um, one of our ICU specialists that may be able to jump in and talk to us about what is code black and what that means for a system that is under that kind of prolonged pressure. Yeah, I, I can talk about that. So um, Greg Kelly is one of the Osage members and an ICU specialist at a large Sydney hospital. So I think the, the question about hospital collapse and ICU collapse is always interesting. And I think the most important thing to say is it's not a it's not a line in the sand where suddenly the system doesn't work. It's a greater degradation of the quality of the care that we provide. There's no doubt that the care we're, that we're already providing in New South Wales is not standard. People, young people shouldn't die at home um, without a prompt medical attention. There's been quite a number of young people that these cases are all tragic um, and they have disproportionately affected minoritized communities and, and hence our call for no one to be left behind. We're already not doing many of the things that we're meant to be doing, scheduled major surgery like cancer and heart surgery. Uh, we're already not doing screening things like mammograms. And so as the system gets more overloaded for longer, the quality of the care that we provide gets more and more degraded. There are non, the deaths that we've modeled, um, it's very important to know that there are non-linear effects possible in those. So you know, if you take out a segment of your workforce, that death rate is going to jump again. If you stop providing routine care, that death rate's going to, that death rate's going to jump again. Those effects are extremely hard to model for, but they are all the more reason why we need to stay within the capacity of the health system, protect that the health workforce, and avoid going into that code black um, for as long as possible. And of course, if we do do that, all of the work that we're already not doing um, builds up for next year. And the Australian healthcare system is good, but it's finely tuned to capacity. And that does mean a sizable, um, again, a load that will continue into next year and beyond, which is what we're seeing in other places that have had sizable COVID surges that are still catching up on the work from last year. So it sounds like a lot of bump on effects when you put the critical care system uh, in this kind of state. Uh, that then basically inhibits uh, a lot of other activities and actions to occur. And I know we've got quite a lot of public health people here as well as some general practitioners who may want to uh, chime in. So whenever they're ready, they're certainly welcome to pop their hand up and I will throw to them. Um, but there is another question here specifically about rapid antigen testing and what role that plays in mitigating this epidemic. How could these be deployed? What are they and how do they work? Um, there's a couple of people who are Osage members more expert than me, like uh, Sharon Chen and Marion Kaner. Maybe one of them would like to take that question. Sharon, sorry to put you on the spot. Mm -hmm. No, she's on the phone, I think. Um, Marion, did you want to answer that one? So 
rapid antigens uh, have different sensitivities and specificities, how accurate they are really varies, but there are some really good ones which are available now. And what is really nice about them is that you can get the result back very rapidly within 15 to 20 minutes. And so you don't have to wait a long time. And as Raina alluded to for contact tracing and things like that, it's really important that people know results very rapidly so that they can do the right thing and isolate and make sure that their close contacts can be in quarantine so that they don't expose other people. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we've also got some other questions um, about the Doherty model um, and that they did include several scenarios, but only one scenario has been used. It had 30 different cases at the time restrictions were made. Um, and that's, that's an interesting um, uh, observation. Rana, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So I think um, that was Liam Mannix's question and uh, why um, uh, our model showed this surge over Christmas. I mean, f the first issue is that the, um, you know, uh, First of all, I should say that the Doherty model broadly uses the same kind of methodology. It's an SEIR model. Um, I'm pretty sure their updated model, I haven't seen it, but they've updated it for the starting cases. Um, in the scenario that's been widely quoted, um, the, the number of cases at the time restrictions are lifted was 30. So that does make a big difference. If you've only got 30 cases, you're in a much better position to lift restrictions because you can manage all the um, contact tracing and case finding, et cetera, with such low numbers. But when you've got thousands of cases at the time you release restrictions and you're already not managing it, it just becomes unmanageable. And when you drop those things like contact tracing, um, case finding, um, et cetera, and relax your mask restrictions, then the, the epidemic's just gonna take off because there's a lot of people who are susceptible and can be infected. And I'm pretty sure that what they find when they update the model for the number of cases won't be wildly different to this. I haven't seen it, but that's my guess. Okay, thank you. Um, we've also got some comments about vaccines are now available to all 12 to 15 year olds. So now basically one over the age of 12 in Australia is available. So what does that mean uh, in regards to the modelling that's been presented? Does that change it significantly? Does that give us any additional fidelity on the propositions of the plan A and plan B of releasing of lockdowns? What does it mean? Well, we had gradual staged increase in vaccination rates in the model um, and we did not have substantial vaccination of children. That's the understanding I have that even for the 12 to 15 year olds where it's approved, it's probably going to be next year when we have, you know, high rates of vaccination in that age group. Um, so for all intents and purposes for the rest of this year, children will be mostly unvaccinated. And so that has consequences for returning to school and how this pandemic spreads. So let's um, talk a little bit about uh, some of those underserviced populations, populations that are hard to get to, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, people residing in communities that have actually got quite extended networks uh, as their day-to-day -day communities and family. The biggest fears that many have is how this pandemic is sweeping through that and the pandemic of the unvaccinated is absolutely the term that's now being used here and certainly in some places abroad. What are the three biggest things that, that need to be sent out to people to do uh, to help prevent the spread of this? In the absence of being able to be jabbed today and to have the full effect of the vaccine, what are the three biggest things that people need to take home and spread the message about? I think we could ask um, Lydia Murawska to comment on that. We're all nodding for you, Lydia. Uh, okay, sorry, I was just finished a uh, conversation. Could you uh, please repeat the question? What, what are the three most important things to do to control the pandemic? Well, uh, what we what have been we've been advocating is that ventilation is one of the critical aspects now uh, when 
we are all getting back to schools to or to the offices. Uh, many of the uh, Australian places are not ventilated at all, like um, many naturally ventilated buildings uh, are not ventilated. Other spaces uh, don't, uh, don't have adequate ventilation. And in most cases, we don't even know whether ventilation is appropriate or not. So this is one of the critical aspects now to ensure that first of all, we establish understanding what the situation with ventilation. And if the ventilation is not adequate, we take steps which are available to us now to improve the ventilation. Uh, in some cases, it is as simple as opening windows. And uh, I've, uh, in many situations, uh, um, managed to achieve in places where I advised conditions that uh, uh, improved uh, to the level of outdoor background. If this is not possible, um, well, um, me uh, in the mechanically ventilation buildings, uh, uh, we should check whether there are any improvements in ventilation. If nothing is possible in terms of ventilation, we need to consider air purifiers. So these are the, the simple, simple ad hoc measures which we can take. Okay, um, so just reminding everybody, you can put your hand up if you want to verbally ask a question and we will um, throw to you or you can pop a question in the chat. Uh, if you don't want everyone to see your question, um, very happy for Alex Evans or myself to have that question sent directly. Just nominate who you'd like to have answer it, please. So Lydia, back to you again. With regards to ventilation, there's a lot being said about the difficulties of getting buildings ventilated. Um, is that because of CO2 buildup or is that because of the way the droplets move? I mean, what is the you know, what is the real issue here for those buildings that can't have the windows thrown open? What, what do we need to do and what does that mean? Well, the difficulty is very profound because so far we haven't uh, thought about ventilation and we haven't thought about the importance of ventilation. And over the years of, I'd say, decades of designing new buildings and turning into the way our modern building operates now, ventilation uh, has been the least of our concerns. So in places where we can't open the windows and we don't have um, a mechanical ventilation, the question is why ventilation has been forgotten. Um, of course, we are saying now it is so difficult. It's a daunting task. Can we do this? Uh, well, everything else is difficult. Pandemic is difficult. So unless we start working on this now, and as I said, in, in, in a simplistic way, uh, check what we can do ad hoc, but we need really to start thinking how we'll operate, how we design our buildings, how we operate, so we will not be in that situation during the next pandemic and in the years to come during the epidemics which we face every year. Yeah, so this, this is not going to go any way, going to go away anytime soon. These issues will be remaining with us for a long time. So how we act now and how we set up uh, the next few years uh, will make a difference. Um, so there, there is a question here um, requesting that Rana uh, quickly run through the best case and the worst case scenarios again. Sure. So the best case scenario is where there's only a single lifting of restrictions, not, you know, X number of freedoms and then an additional number, but just a single uh, relaxing of restrictions with enhanced contact tracing. So really, and that's assuming that the testing rate is adequate, um, that, the, the, and high, that we've got high testing capacity. And I don't know um, if that's true or not. I think it's still reasonably good, the testing capacity, but um, if the case numbers get really big, that the testing capacity could get impacted as well. So um, yeah, I think you, you, there are, it's, it's, you can tweak different, th basically what you've got at your, at your disposal are, the things that will influence the size of the, size of the epidemic are number one, people mixing with each other, right? And that's what the relaxing of restrictions does. It increases the mixing, which we all want. Um, but it's dangerous when there's a, vi a virus like this around. Number two is the contact tracing. And number three is the case finding or testing. The testing and contact tracing are, other than vaccination, the two most influential things in controlling an epidemic. Um, and the other thing that can also help is the masks. There's now ample evidence from around the world 
that face masks do mitigate transmission. Um, there's a big RCT that just came out of Bangladesh that showed that in used in the community, it actually had a really good impact in reducing uh, the, the COVID rates. So I think, you know, um, if I think dropping the, you know, relaxing the mask mandates is not a good idea. I mean, the mask still allows us to go shopping or go and visit our family or do the things we want to do. So we need to look at the kind of interventions that are not impinging on freedom that can be really optimised. So that, that was the scenario too, where you have enhanced contact tracing. One of the problems with contact tracing, trying to use digital methods, is that um, there's usually a privacy issue. It's hard in Western countries because uh, you can't just, you know, take what you want off a person's mobile phone. In some Asian countries, they do use quite invasive digital methods to just get the information, um, but it's been a barrier in Western countries. However, we do have public health legislation in all states, which allows you um, to do pretty draconian things <laughs> like, uh, you know, get information from a person's mobile. It's possible, you know, the law experts will have to look into that, but that's what public health legislation is for. Um, I think if, that, if you don't have to scan in your QR code, if you can just walk through a door of a, of a business and it just takes your information automatically, notifies you automatically if you were a contact, that would really enhance the scaling up of contact tracing because any of these scenarios... When you lift, when you relax the restrictions, you're going to get a second peak that's bigger than any peak we're facing right now under the current restrictions. So, you know, the bad times are ahead. Unfortunately, that's the situation we're in. So yeah. we really need to be looking at some of these other solutions to make sure everything else that we can do is optimal. And of course, the ventilation and safe indoor air is part of that, a very important part of that. When we think about opening schools, we've got to make sure that um you know the the kids are going into a well ventilated environment where the air is clean yeah absolutely vaccinated teachers and community around them uh, you may hear planes overhead um so it's the first time at this time of day i've heard planes overhead but that reminds me of the big enormous economic impact um, that COVID has had on us and I'm delighted to see that Richard Holden is here and I'm wondering if we could just throw to Richard just for a couple of moments to uh, share with us some of the work that you've been doing specifically around the economy. Thanks Lisa. I think one of the important lessons from last year and this year around the world is that public health outcomes and economic outcomes are really closely linked and of course you know when we're talking here about people dying and case numbers um, and, and hospital systems breaking down that's the first order and most important impact, but it's also worth remembering that this has an impact on the economy and ultimately on, on jobs and other things. And um, if we saw the kind of numbers that um, are coming out of the models that Rainer talked through, you would see a very significant impact on the economy. And one of the things we also learned from last year is that there's not just uh, the economic impact of a lockdown that's coordinated through public health measures, but there's also what some of us have called the self-lockdown. And really good evidence coming out of the US has shown that at least in the US last year, up to 90% of the drop in economic activity happened from people seeing really large outbreaks and, and, and locking themselves down, if you like, not going out, not uh, generating economic activity because of fear of the virus. Now, we're unlikely to see anything as dramatic as what we saw in the US last year, but if we see these signs of numbers, even if restrictions have been lifted, then there will be a very significant impact on the economy akin to what we saw last year, uh, or possibly even worse at certain points. Yet it seems that is exactly where we're going to. Thanks very much for taking that um, not on notice um, uh, query. Um, I've also seen the comments that there's a lot of discussion about masks, how they should be worn, what type of masks should be used in the community, how do we engage with the public to get them uh, to wear masks. I know that when I've travelled abroad in years past, pre-COVID, you know, there are a lot of people in communities, you know, wearing masks, as, you know, whenever they go outside. And this was obviously uh, something that is just done when people go into congested environments. So um, to our mask experts. Um, where, what is the protocol around what sort of masks should be worn at this time? Um, and how should we make sure that we have good mask hygiene?
Um, so I think there's, you know, there's this ample evidence now that the masks work, they reduce the transmission, both by protecting well people from inhaling contaminated air, and also from uh, preventing someone who's infected and may not know they're infected, because a lot of this transmission is asymptomatic, um, from exhaling contaminated aerosols into the air. So it works both ways. And um, an ordinary surgical mask or cloth mask was good enough um, in the, for the previous variants, but the US has just brought in recommendations for you know, respirators, uh, N95s, et cetera, for the community. Um, I think for us with um, facing sort of probably, um, you know, worsening epidemic in the coming months, it's not a good idea to use up our stocks of N95s, our health workers and other frontline people need them. Um, but there are other methods that uh, can be used like double masking and the way you twist and tie the, the, um, the loops, ear loops, to basically you need to improve the fit of the mask around the face because no matter how good the filter is, if you've got gaps, when you breathe, the air will just flow through the gaps and you'll be breathing unfiltered air. And there's lots of um, fix, fix, quick fixes to improve the fit of any kind of mask. You can also design a reasonably good cloth mask if you follow certain design principles. Um, we've published a paper on that. Um, basically, you need to pick the right kind of fabrics for the right layer, different types of fabrics for different layers. Um, and you need the, the other good thing about do it yourself masks is that you can make one to fit your child um, and they can help you to pick the fabric, etc. So, uh, yeah, I think there's a range of different options. We do have an advice paper coming out on community mask use. So there's a, a final question, and we've only got enough time for this last one. It's about contact tracing. Now, just to contextualise this, I was a contact tracer back in the day in the 90s, um, and contract tracing is a real art. Uh, it's hard to do, uh, and the best thing uh, about it is that you need to do it, as uh, one of our presenters spoke to, uh, as soon as there's a notification, you get onto contact tracing. And I think that it's not so much that contact tracing is not working anymore, but the real uh, live scenario that we're living at the moment is that there are just so many cases and there's so much work. I can remember that sometimes it took two or three days uh, just to contact trace one case. So that was my experience back in the day, um, but I'd be interested to hear uh, comments from our panelists about uh, contact tracing, uh, whether or not it's working, um, or whether or not it's working in some sort of limited form here in New South Wales. So who'd like to take that? I think so in the model, we estimated that on the six, by the 16th, of, that when we started the epidemic, the contact tracing rates were over 90% of very rapid. And then it gradually started dropping as the case numbers got bigger and bigger because each case on average might have 10 to 20 contacts, right? So if you've got a thousand cases a day, that's 10,000 contacts to trace just for that day, let alone the ones you're monitoring that are already in the system and quarantined. So it become, the task becomes exponentially bigger, um, more so for contacts than for cases, which is why the digital methods um, that some of the Asian countries have used can help. Yeah, there is a reality about that. Okay, colleagues, that is uh, coming up to um, the time of four o'clock, unless there are any uh, absolute comments that people would like to make or a final, final quick question. I will now draw this panel to a close. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, please have a look at our website. You'll see more information come on that. Check it daily. Uh, it should be uh, very, very loved and very used. Thank you very much. We'll see you again. Bye for now. <laughs>